Hi folks and welcome back for what's going to be part two of my Digital Sky Project videos. Um, now this is basically just the last week of my life but if you remember at the end of part one we'd got all the circuit board soldered together and things were sort of working but there was a problem with all the strips flickering and flashing and doing weird things. So in this video we debug all of that and well I won't give you the spoilers of what happens after that. And um, what I will say is we'll do all the debugging and the lights and then at the end as kind of a little bonus content, a little mini mailbag video because there's a couple of things that turned up and someone was very kind and sent me a thing. So anyway, um, last week we were debugging things. Let's carry on. So back to debugging this uh, amazing flickering light problem. So things have improved because I actually did a little bit of debugging off camera. So I'm just going to unplug the uh, signal going in here somewhere along the way just to uh, stop epileptic seizures and things like that. <coughs> so there were a couple of problems that I've already corrected on here. Um, there was a pin lifted on one leg on this chip or where it hadn't soldered properly so that was why I think it was that strip at the time was locked on solid the whole time. So that sorted that one out. Um, now it's actually behaving quite well right now which is uh, typical because I'm trying to film it. Let's see if we can get to something where things get flickery. There we go. So that's not even got a signal coming in now. That's doing it all by itself without getting new data coming in. That's not pushing data through the shift registers because the NeoPixels are all remaining constant. Now this is a weird thing and if I press on certain parts of the board it seems to influence the behaviour to some extent. Now I have already tried adding a bunch of little um, bypass capacitors and that's made no difference whatsoever so I've taken them off again. Um, another fault I found was I'd shorted two of the pins on this hex inverter chip on the 4049. So I've cleaned that up but still we're doing strange things. And the thing I really can't understand is we've got four independent channels for all of this and uh, they're driven by four separate signals, yet all four channels appear to be behaving identically. So I suspect that this 4049 chip here might have been damaged when I soldered it in or when I shorted the two pins or there might be a bad connection on it or something like that. Now, as I think there could be a variety of different things going wrong here, um, one, one of the things I really want to rule out is whether I've got bad design or just bad assembly. So I think the first thing I'm going to do is um, just build a duplicate of this board up so I can test another one the same but just soldered again in a different set of components. So I'm going to do that now and um, we'll see how that works out when it's ready.
Well, I now have two identically misfunctioning boards. So um, I'm now confident it's not a manufacturing issue with that one. I've soldered everything properly because uh, this one's doing exactly the same thing. And this one has much, much finer, nicer soldering than that one. I've improved radically since uh, Thursday, I think I put that one together. So anyway, uh, try, time to work out what to do about this. Whole different problem. So I've now added a 100 nanofarad bypass capacitor to each and every chip on there and it's made no difference whatsoever. We've got a new fuse on this board now. This was the one with all the capacitors on because um, they short circuited against the tab on that transistor. Anyway, um, I'm fairly sure this bit of the circuit's doing what it should do. The bit that's kind of an unknown for me is what the MOSFET drivers should be doing because um, I've just got the microcontroller going straight to the gate on those MOSFETs to drive it, whereas on the board I had on the breadboard there's this opto isolator chip and a few more resistors scattered around. So what I think I might try is remove one of these FETs and um, drop that in circuit in place of the FET and just kind of wire that board into place. I've also noticed that the behaviour on this board um, seems not quite the same as it was on the breadboard circuit in that uh, when I first connect the power and I haven't fed any signal in all these MOSFETs appear to be switched full on and I think with the breadboard setup they were switched off so I suspect that this may need to change from an inverter to a non-inverting buffer so I've ordered a bunch of those which should be here in a few days time. Okay so I guess the problem isn't how I was driving those MOSFETs because uh, with that MOSFET board in it's doing exactly the same thing so that's uh, one less thing to worry about as difference from the breadboard version. But I'm really struggling to work out what other differences there are. Same IC, just a different package, same chips, uh, possibly slightly different value of resistor. Don't see why that would matter. Okay, I think I'm on to something now. So in continuity here and uh, checking on ground, find that none of the pins on this uh, 4049 hex inverter I see are connected to ground and on 5 volts again none of them are hooked up so uh, somehow or other I managed to get it without power and ground hooked up to this IC which should probably explain all the weird flashing things going on because uh, this hasn't actually got any power to properly drive those MOSFETs so I'm going to run some jumper wires over here run some bodge wires and see how we get on but this could, this could be a win so it turns out the problem's actually a bit worse than just no power routed to this chip checked on this other board well first of all i soldered some bodge wires in and then discovered that this thing wouldn't power on anymore checking on this board i discovered the auto routers actually run a track from vcc to vss on that chip all by itself so when i do hook power on there's a short circuit so on this particular board i've put a little tiny slice there but I'm going to have to lift this chip off and do the same modification on that board to uh, be able to do this bodge. I'll attempt to do this in front with the camera in the way. Uh, I don't know whether this will work. It's way, way easier soldering when no one's looking. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. I'm not going to be able to align that with the, the camera in the way. But, uh, I'll get that soldered back on and we'll see where we're at after that. So there we are, chip resoldered and we're all beautifully bodge wired up now. And 
I am so, so happy. We've not got the horrible flickering anymore. We're actually doing proper fades on all the different strips and we seem to have proper PWM control. So I was getting rather worried for uh, quite a while there because uh, I thought these boards were going to be a dead loss or I thought I'd done something unbelievably stupid somehow routing my signals around there. I was getting really kind of flummoxed as to what was going wrong here. But um, no, it's all actually working properly now. It was the pesky auto router. I'd been fighting with that in the software. I'd noticed it had done it lots of times and I'm sure I fixed it before I did this final version. But um, ah well, at least it's fixable for the next board so I can solder a few more of these up now. So I could probably have used my time for something a bit more productive but I've been mucking around with the Arduino code and counting for the fact that some of the pixels are actually driving the strips so I've got kind of smooth animations going now and a, a reasonable test of different brightness levels and when everything's on full tilt which it'll do in a second it really is uh, quite a lot of light it kicks out even that's not full tilt oh, that's pretty that's full tilt I was sent this by Dan Herring so thank you very much for this Dan um, and this is a set of breakout boards for a variety of different chip formats and there's a note inside it which I haven't seen yet let's see what we've got in here so here we go we have our super breakout use screwdriver and pliers to snap the breakouts out and then we've got a variety of different packaging formats so TQFP64, SOT23-3, MLF64, SOIC8, SOD123, SOT63, sorry SOT363, TQFP44, SOD323, MLF44, 1206, oh yeah standard component sizes. So just to get a bit of a better look at this let's do some zooming in here. So you can see we've got breakout here for the two different 64 pin package styles that take it to a massive like it was the Motorola 68000 was that format of package before I remember from my Commodore Amiga but yeah each of those two different foot pits broken out to the 64 pins same here for the 48 pin package maybe 32 pin packages 44s possibly but um, this will be the TQFP 44 and QFN 44s um, all sorts of things here for SOIC 8s which are what the um, WS2811 chips that I'm using are so those would have come in handy for this project um, and lots of things for smaller two pin packages as well and uh, three pin SOT23s and things like that so um, I don't know if this is something Dan makes um, help at wonkyresistor.com um, but yeah looks good so thank you very much for that Dan that will definitely come in useful in the future I didn't realise when I was opening the mail, but if you look, there's actually one set of footprints on this side of the board and different footprints on some of the component on some of the breakout boards on the opposite side. So actually even more flexible than I first thought. So a uh, big SOIC8 layout there and then a small one on the opposite side. So, yeah, very nice. Thank you, Dan. So here we have a, another mailbag item. Um, which I feel I can show you now you've watched everything else because uh, that's a significant change afoot. Uh, get into here. Uh. Now here we are, we've got a uh, 36 volt 9.7 amp power supply. So I had previously been planning on running everything on 24 volts but I discovered that a single strip will actually pull over 40 watts. So um, two of them was two strips were doing 87 watts and I realized that 10 amps at 240 volts wouldn't be enough. But also I noticed that the um, DC DC converter modules I'm using will go all the way up to 37 volts. So I thought I'd get a power supply because um, my little bench power supply is running out of amps and I uh, can't build any more units. So there we are, nothing amazing. I'm hoping the fan is temperature controlled and won't run the whole time. But we'll give that a try in part three. Okay, so that's it for part two, folks. Um, I've now got three 
lamps all wired up and working on the shelf behind me. But um, I'm umming and ahhing whether to redesign the circuit boards. I think I probably will. Um, I certainly need to do lots of work on the actual uh, format of the lamps themselves. I'm quite happy with the two heat sinks and the circuit board on the back, but um, clearly I need to do some work on the diffusers and which bits are going to be 3D printed or other things. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this, folks. Um, if you did, come back and join me for part three, probably two weeks' time, because I need to do lots of other bits in between. Anyway, nice seeing you again, folks, and um, take it easy. Bye!